in response, he's made the number two man, and he's tasked with storing up food for that. The brothers that betrayed him 20-some-odd years earlier come to buy food. They don't recognize him, and he secretly tests their character. And then just last week, we talked about when he reveals his true identity to them. So in these chapters we're looking at today, you see the family uh, coming, joining him in, in, in Egypt. So we got two chapters to cover. I'm going to read through it all, and then we'll, we'll try to make some application of that. Starting in chapter 46. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Don't be, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I also will bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, their little ones and their wives, and the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt. Jacob and all, of off, and all of his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. Now these are the names of the descendants of Israel who came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jacob, Zohar and Sheol, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hemel. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Zered, Elon, and Jaleel. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob, and Padan Aram, together with his daughter Dinah. Altogether, his sons and his daughters numbered thirty-three. The sons of Gad, Ziphion, Haggai, Shuni, Esbon, Eri, Arodi, and Areli. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Bariah with Sarah, their sister. And the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Mal Malkiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, sixteen persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph and Benjamin. And to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore to him. And the sons of Benjamin, Bela, Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The sons of Dan, Husham. The sons of Naphtali, Jezeel, Guni, Jezer, and Shilam. These are the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban bore to Rachel, his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons' wives, were sixty-six persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were seventy. He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him in Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel his father in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? You shall say, Your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers. 
in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers, with their flocks and herds and all that they possess, have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, as our fathers were. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their dependents. Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land shall be servants to Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may, not, that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your households, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. The land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. Thus... Israel settled in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt. But let me live with my fathers. Let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. 
Okay, a lot to cover there. Um, first thing I want to know, I think it was last week, maybe in the week before, I can't remember now, but starts out with chapter by Jacob, again, once again, offering sacrifices. It says that he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And it's, this is a map of Israel. I showed this same map once before early in this series when we were talking about um, where Joseph was, um, found his brothers and where he's betrayed. The family started in Hebron. You see the little blue line there from Hebron down to Beersheba. And Beersheba is traditionally the very southern end of Israel. In, in this instance, the family has apparently been dwelling in, in Hebron all these years. Don't know that for sure, but that's apparently right. They journey on down to Beersheba, and it's in Beersheba that he offers sacrifices to God. And at least the scripture indicates that it's been in the neighborhood of 30 years since he's offered uh, sacrifices, since Jacob, Israel, as God renamed him, has offered sacrifices to God. Uh, and, and you get the, I get the sense in reading through these two chapters and the subsequent chapters that Jacob is much more connected, if you will, connected to God than he's been throughout Benjamin's life because it was at the birth of that youngest son, Benjamin, that Rachel died. And, and apparently, apparently, he kind of, um, it causes him to withdraw from God. But once again, he, he re-engages with God. And in offering sacrifices at Beersheba, it's possible that he's offering sacrifices at the same altar that his father Isaac built. If you go all the way back to Genesis 26, um, and this is speaking of Isaac, from there he went up to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he, Isaac, built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Perhaps he's offering at the same, same altar. The, it's interesting, the things that God says to um, Isaac, it's, it's almost exactly what he says to, uh, to Jacob, to Israel, when he, when he comes back. Uh, he offers, he, he identifies as a as the God of their father uh, is going to make him into a great nation. Uh, verse 4, it is different about bringing him down to Egypt and, and the specifics about Joseph uh, closing uh, Jacob's eyes and, and when he passes away. But otherwise, very similar. Uh, so it's, it's, it's possible. But the offspring that journey to Egypt, you know, the emphasis, it went through that long litany of of offspring all the names all the complex names uh to get to go through i did practice that several times by the way before i was, I was didn't roll off the first time but the emphasis is 70 70 blood relatives of abraham that settled in Egypt. that is the emphasis um here in the in 26 and 27 and they throw a lot of numbers and it gets a little confusing because it says all the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt were 66 but the total number of the house of Jacob that came into Egypt are 70 and if you dive into details it talks about 33 are the offspring of, of Leah his his first wife 16 the offspring of Zilpah uh, his his, uh, his wife well Leah's handmaid 14 of, of Rachel and finally seven offspring of Bilhah, and if you add 33, 16, 14, and 7, it adds up to 70 is the total number that comes into Egypt. There are some complexities, though, in that. And the first complication is when they're listing the offspring of, um, of Leah, the 33, it's made a little complicated because they list 34 individual names. Uh, so that's What's up with that, you know? Uh, it's, it's an odd way to list 33 people by giving a list of 34. Um, it's, it's in verse 15 there. They say that the number is 33. And, and remember that 33 is important for adding up to 70. So 33 is the real number. So what's up with 34 people being listed? Well, keep in mind the emphasis is on those 
who go to Egypt. That's the emphasis. And there's 34 named originally, but two of them died a long time ago. Ur and Onan, the sons of Judah, they died a long time ago. So they didn't make the journey. So we're, we're down two. And then to make 33, you add Jacob himself. He's not of the offspring of Leah, of course. He's the husband. But again, the emphasis is 70 people went to Egypt. And 70 being, um, you know, there's, there's some significance in that number, if you will, being a, a, a kind of a, a number that represents wholeness or completeness or perfection. Um, but that's the emphasis. If you add 33 that we just got by this, and 16 and 14 and 17, is 70 descendants of Abraham, according to the promise. That's the number that make its way to Egypt. You've got to count Jacob among that number, right? So he's not, gonna, he's not technically a, well, he's not a son of any of these women, but he is among the descendants of Abraham's that make his way. So anyway, that's where you get that. As for the 66, that one's a little easier to understand. It's 66 descendants that make the journey, plus Jacob, plus Joseph, who's already in Egypt, and his sons that are already in Egypt. So you, add, you roll all that up, ah, we come up with the same 70 number all over again. So it takes a little study and figure it out when you first... If you bother counting names, uh, if you're an accountant type and you bother counting names, <laughs> then uh, you know, something doesn't add up. But you dig into it a little bit, and it, 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 and it does. So I want to talk a little bit here about Joseph selling grain to the Egyptians and also to the Canaanites, it says. But um, It strikes me as a little odd, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, truth be told, I'm a little undecided about this um does joseph misuse his power during the famine i mean consider this he provides for his own family others are forced to sell their livestock and their property in order just to just to feed their family uh, he moves the people off their off their land into the cities and the people are ultimately forced to become indentured servants to to pay for their food is that a misuse is that an abuse of the power that he's been given. Like I said, I'm a little unsettled, but frankly, for the most part, I, I, I don't think so. First of all, it's not consistent with the text that he simply takes everything that they have and leaves them, leaves them poor. Uh, the picture is one where, where he, they go into debt. They go into debt to Pharaoh. They, they give their livestock they give their, their belongings. They're not going to be very good for farming once, once the famine is over if Pharaoh's got all their livestock. Uh, they're not going to be useful if all their belongings, including their farming implements and, and such as they need, all belong to somebody else. So it's more of a picture, it seems to fit the text better, that they go into debt. Uh, they agree to go into debt in order to, to receive food. Um, and, and this... Um, kind of ties into it here about the example of, of Joseph giving them seeds so that they can, they can provide. Well, that's part of the paying of, of the debt. That it's not just feeding them now, but giving them enough so they can uh, replant the following year and make it through this, this famine and ultimately be able to pay Pharaoh back. Um, he also, he doesn't personally profit from this. Uh, he's the text makes a makes a point of that he provides the money into Pharaoh's house. So he's not he's not pocketing the proceeds of this. He's doing Pharaoh's order. And 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 keep in mind, Pharaoh in the land of Egypt has gone through a lot of expense during the seven years of plenty in building all these granaries and protecting them and you know all that litany that went into it, and they're going to a decent amount of expense now to, uh, to keep it protected and to keep it uh, distributed. So it's not like all this came for free. And finally, um, ultimately, and I think, I think this is significant, the people thank him for saving, and that's not a typical response uh, when you put somebody in subjugation, when you put somebody in a, 
uh, in, in handcuffs, so to speak. They don't typically thank you for that. But they recognize that, that what he's doing is, is really pulling them out of pinch. It's, it's going to save them. So my, my, my leaning is that this is not an abuse of power, but, but there, there's aspects of it that are still wrestling with a little bit. I want to spend the rest of my lesson here talking about the, the land of Goshen. It's called the best of the land in the text. And um, we'll pull up a map in just a second, but Goshen is apparently, best we can tell, it's on the east side of the Nile Delta. It's also, the text also calls it the land of Ramesses. And that's, that's an interesting word, uh, uh, Ramesses being the name of a, of a famous pharaoh of the of the. 13th century BC. Um, archaeologists and those who've studied this a lot, not me, but those who have, uh, think that Ramses could be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And so, if so, it's pointing to this, this writing as, uh, you know, of all of Genesis, uh, likely, as being post Exodus, you know, writing and, and of, of the things that happened previous. And so perhaps it points to that. Um, if you look at a map, there's up in the upper right hand corner, there's Hebron, where they started, and Beersheba. Uh, you know, again, Beersheba, Beersheba being the lowermost, the southernmost tip of, of Israel historically. You'll read in the text that when they're talking about all of Israel, they'll say from, from Dan to Beersheba, Dan being the tippy top, the northernmost. Beersheba being the, the southernmost. Uh, so Dan to Beersheba, that's a fairly common way of describing the entirety of the, of the nation. But they, they travel from, from there uh, all the way into, into Goshen, again, which is the eastern side of the, of the Nile Delta. Uh, it's, it's there, ultimately, that the people are going to be enslaved. And they're going to, uh, the text, in, when you get over in Exodus, talks about they build the cities of Ramses and Pithom. Uh, which are storage cities or commerce cities, um, but it's it's these. Today it's a it's a it's a great desert, but back in the day it was kind of a grassland, um, and so that's going to make it not necessarily the greatest farming land in the world. It's called the best of the land, not necessarily for farming. That's going to be right next to the river closer to the river where the floods are going to be doing their, their watering and, and laying down the deposits. But it is going to be a fine grassland for, uh, for, for livestock, which is what the Israelites are interested in. That's their occupation. Joseph obviously intends Goshen as a place of refuge for his family. You know, the, the, the words that he uses to his family, um, when you dwell in the land of Goshen, you're going to be near me, your children and your children's children and, and everything you have, I'm going to provide for you during this famine uh, so that you and, and, and the whole household, the entire family, does not come to poverty. So he's clearly looking at this Goshen as being an island of refuge for his family. And you have to say that Pharaoh certainly welcomed uh, Joseph's family and looked upon their coming as a good thing. Um, they don't hold men of livestock in high esteem, but they do have livestock. Matter of fact, there's uh, archaeological evidence that the Egyptians, um, you know, they kind of turn their noses up at, at people who do the job of taking care of livestock, but the text, the uh, archaeological evidence shows they, they brought in a lot of foreign labor to manage their livestock, so they weren't they weren't above eating it. <laughs> so they liked eating it. They liked the, uh, uh, the benefits that come from the pack animals and stuff like that. But they didn't really think much of taking care of it. The point is here that, that Pharaoh welcomes the family in. And they give them a, a, a good land to settle in and find a use for them. Uh, that, hey, if you guys are handy with livestock, I can use some help with our own livestock here, right? Pretty much welcomes it in and gives them a, a purpose there. I found this interesting. This is something new that, uh, that I learned uh, just uh, in studying the text. The Israelites even come to own some of the land in Goshen. Um, in verse 11 and in verse 27, it talks about 
they gave, became a, a, a possession of the land. Now, that word, was it's the same word that God uses when he's talking about the promised land. That you're going to dwell, you're going to sojourn, you're going to travel, you're going to be aliens in this land until you possess the promised land. Ultimately, you will, it'll be yours and you will possess it. And it gets used nowhere in the context of the family of Abraham. The first time it actually gets used here is in Egypt, of all places. And it's, mentioned, it's used a couple times. That they come to ultimately to even um, Pharaoh grants them possession. They own some of this land outright. It makes for an interesting interplay when um, they own this land, yet their neighboring Egyptians and Canaanites are all having to sell their land in order to pay for food. Um, and, and clearly, where others are starving, Joseph's family is prospering. They're doing, they're doing quite well here in Goshen. Um, Joseph is providing for them. I mean, the famine is still hitting Goshen. Don't, give, don't misunderstand, but Joseph is making sure that his family is taken care of, that they're, that they're well supplied. Um, the verses I have here juxtaposed together, 12 and 15, talks about Joseph provides food for his family, but for the Egyptians, they're, having, they're saying, well, give us food. And Joseph's saying, well, you're going to have to pay for it. But for his family, they're being provided for. So... Um, in kind of an interesting interplay there, these, uh, these foreigners, the Israelites coming in, Joseph's family coming in, and, and they're being well provided for, but the, the natives are, are having to uh, go all out. Um, but the point I want to make, the point I want to make is that despite all the blessings of Goshen, despite all the place of refuge, and a home, and the, and the fact that they're even taking possession of some of the land, it's still not home. It's not home. And you see that best in this text, in, uh, in Jacob's final wishes, when he makes it known that their true home is back in Canaan, in the land that God has promised. That's home. This is a great place to visit, and we're glad to be here, and we're going to be well taken care of, but it's not home. You see in, in Genesis, uh, in, in the very end of chapter 47 there, uh, where, where, where Jacob asks a favor of his son, and he makes him swear on it, that uh, do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. Well, where is that? Well, that's back in the land of Canaan. That's in the promised land. Swear to me that you're going to take me back home is what Jacob makes us, makes us some, some swear. Because Goshen, great though it is, it's not home. It's not the land that God has promised them. And I wanted to make some application here in the sense that in, in just like uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just like each of them, God has likewise promised us a future homeland. It's while we are in this, while we're visiting this place, this place which has its own beauty, it has its own blessings, it has its own temptations. But God asks us to live in this place while we look forward to going home, because this is not our home. If you look over in Hebrews, this chapter in Hebrew, this passage in Hebrews, it talks about, um, it talks about specifically about Abraham, and it talks about Sarah. But you could apply this to, to all of the patriarchs: Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and and, and Sarah, of course. Uh, but the Hebrew writer is is pay attention to what he's doing. He's he's telling the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for our benefit. He's making application to the present day where we are in our walk with, in our relationship to Christ. So read it with that mindset. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive 
as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. So, what is the Hebrew writer teaching us about, again, using the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to teach us? Well, by faith, by faith, we are called to a glorious future inheritance that's planned by God. We are called to a glorious future inheritance that's planned by God. By faith, we live in tents. You know, the, in, in, in 2 Corinthians, it describes this that we're wearing just as tents. And we live in these as strangers, aliens in a foreign land, awaiting fulfillment of the promise of God. And by faith, we, we spend the days of our lives without ever laying eyes on the promised land, but remaining confident that the promise is coming, that the, that, that, the, that the land that God has promised is going to be there without, without ever seeing it. That's what the Hebrew writer is telling us. I'm going to go, th- basically I'm going to close with various passages that talk about that inheritance. And as God's people today, what, what we can look forward to. Passage, well-known passage from Matthew. Um, I th- tend to focus on the rest, on the rest of the passage where he talks about the, you know, the sheep and all, and all the, the good things the sheep has done, and they're on the right, and the and the goats, all the failure to do good things puts them on the left. But but just look at the very introduction. Then the king will say to those on his right, "Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world." God has prepared for His people a glorious inheritance that's waiting for us. And He also said in John, just as He's heading to the cross, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may also be going. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way to where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus was more than a guide. Jesus was more than a pointing the way. He is the way to the inheritance. Through the Christ is the way to the inheritance. The place where his Father is prepared <laughs> for centuries. Uh, well, time eternal. So since the foundation of the world. God is prepared for his people. Philippians talks about our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him 
even to subject all things to himself. You know, in one sense, in one sense, I'm an American citizen. I think most of you are likewise in one sense. But in a larger sense, God teaches our citizenship is in heaven. And this is just a place that we're hanging out temporarily as aliens, not our homeland. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it also describes that we are ambassadors of our homeland. We are stationed on foreign soil representing our king as its ambassadors reaching out to those in the name of our king. That's our role. And ultimately, we'll be taken, uh, we'll, we'll receive our inheritance, and these tents that we dwell in will be exchanged for something uh, glorious. The Hebrew writer says, it, 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 and keep in mind, it, it, he's talking here about the, the suffering that they're enduring. But he's telling them why you need to stay with it. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew, you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Endure knowing, knowing in the confidence, without ever having seen it, but having believed by faith in the promises that God has, without having seen by faith, know that He's going to deliver on what He's promised. And finally... I'm going to close with this passage from uh, Hebrews 12. It's, it's just a beautiful description of, of, what's, of the inheritance that's coming. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That's the promise. Whereas the Hebrew writer in 11 is talking about they're looking forward to that city that has foundation, and here he's describing. He's describing that city, which is the home of God, and the, and the Son, and the firstborn, and the angels, and it's a beautiful picture. And more passages than I had time to cite, but, it, but, but kind of it's, where's the so what in that? Well, the so what in that, and you can look in these various passages see for yourself, do not lose heart. Do not lose heart while we are stationed on foreign soil, but look to the things that are unseen, but eternal. Do not waver in your faith, as she's describing Abraham, that he didn't, favor, he didn't waver in his faith, but he remained anchored and firm in the conviction that God would deliver what he's promised. And be willing to suffer the same suffering that Christ did. That's where the Hebrew writer is going uh, with, with his last passages that we quoted, that it is so worth it. It's so worth it. So endure the suffering that Christ did. And finally, be grateful. Be grateful to God and worship him with reverence and awe. Be grateful to God that for what, what he has done and uh, where, he's, where he's taken us. So, Guys, that's kind of the message I had. A little early, but that's what I had. So, <laughs> We'll see you next week. We'll uh, dive into chapter 48 and see you then.